Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Tonight is Thursday, July, January 9th, 2020. Welcome to the new year. So we're going to be doing these about once a week. Every time when I have a chance to broadcast, we'll be having one of these question and answer sessions. So that means that any family or a friend uh, of Evoke, any family member that's a, of an extended family or, or, or friend of Evoke, clients who want to attend this, can attend. It's it's some place that you can ask questions. You can have access, get learn things to help give support to your family member that might be a parent of an Evoke client, or maybe even to your family member or friend who might be a child at Evoke Therapy Program. So it's welcome to, to all. You can also ask questions that they've asked you. If you are a parent at Evoke, ask questions that siblings, that your extended family, that your parents may have asked you. I'm happy to, to give my answer to those questions. And then tonight, I'm going to start off with a list of questions. There are some live questions coming in, but I'm going to start off with a, a list of questions that I came up with that were asked to me in various contexts. The first one is actually going to be something that happened during our, our clinical phone call, and, and I think it's an interesting question with some interesting concepts. So while, while I'm talking, you can type in the question at any point, and then when I get to the, to the, the open part of the broadcast, I'll, I'll answer any live questions that have come in. So first and foremost, I was talking with our staff. There's a poster. I, I chose a few posters on the wall of our staff room of our where we do our in-service trainings with our staff and, and, and sometimes our therapists. And I chose a few posters to have some quotes, some ideas, some concepts. We have a list of the eight tools for improving relationships, which is one of our most listened to podcasts. Um, we have a poem by Cahill Gibran on good and evil, where, where it talks about the change in sensibility from thinking about things as uh, as right and wrong to beginning to think about them as healed and wounded. And then we also have this quote. This is the third poster that I ask our, our program directors to have up there. I want it to be a reference point. I want staff to walk into the room to read this, to, to wonder about it, and to ask questions. And I want, when we're when we're teaching, I want it to be a reference point. So I'm going to read the quote to you. This quote is also in, in the book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. And it's from a book called Influence and Autonomy in Psychoanalysis by Stephen Mitch Mitchell. It says this, it says, the emphasis is not on behaviors, but on rigorous thinking. He's talking, of course, about being a therapist or an analyst. The emphasis is not on behaviors, but on rigorous thinking, not on constraints, but on self-reflective emotional involvement, not on the application of general truths, but on imaginative participation. This suggests a very different sort of technique. The discipline is not in the procedures, but in the sensibility through which we participate. There is no ger generic solution or technique. There's a great deal of disciplined thought and continual complex choices. So I went over this on our recent training session, talking to the therapist, wanting to, to make sure that they understood why I put this on the board and why this is such a core concept, because really what I, I want them to, to do is to be deeper thinkers, right? I don't want people to hide behind techni techniques and behavioral responses, but to, to understand how they relate to the client, to, to the parent how they're feeling about the client or the parent and how that supersedes really any approach or technique that we might be using. Techniques and theories can be helpful, of course, but if we don't take into account the feeling and even the thought that we have about our clients, those techniques and theories won't do us any good. They're, they're going to be used in the service of, of, of acting out the feeling the emotional response to the client. So that, that's something I, I want us to be aware of. So as I taught this, um, one of the, the therapists asked me the question. I thought very wisely. He said, but what am I supposed to say when a parent asks me for, quote unquote, the steps to take in order to get the child to change for the better? And I thought that was a very good, good question. Um, and what I said to them, first of all, and this is a complex topic concept. So for those of you that are new, 
I'm going above and beyond kind of the, the typical stuff that we talk about tonight in this first question. First and foremost, I explained to the therapist is the question that is being asked from you is coming from the defense. I'm, I'm going to make that clear. It's, it's the defense that's talking. Right. And by that, what I mean is it's the unconscious defense against a parent's ability, willingness to say, what am I doing? What do I need to work on? How might I be participating in this in terms of my thinking, my feeling? What do I need to heal? What's what's kind of my part of the, if, if, if we look at a family system and virtually any therapeutic program in the entire world with, with anything knows that, that when we treat individuals, the identified patient, that we're treating a systemic issue, typically in the family system, but also in the cultural system and the peer system and the school and academic system also. But it's a systemic issue that's being signified by the, this individual's pathology. So when we, when we reduce the, 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 the line of questioning down to what can I do to fix the kid, to change the kid, even for the better, which there's no harm in that. There's no malice in that thought. We're in a sense engaging the defense. And so I said to the, to the, the therapist, I said, first of all, recognize the wisdom in the question. The question's a, a, the, it's a great place to start. But don't answer the question. Because there is no generic set of steps. If there was, we would give them to them. There'd be one book. Therapy is about a different way of being. It's about a different way of being with the client. And the parenting work that we do at Evoke is about a different way of being in the world, thinking, feeling, interacting, seeing yourself, seeing others. It's a different way of being, and it's a different way of being with a child. What's your relationship to the child? Where do you stop and they start? What's your responsibility for, for their issues or, or not? What do you have control over and what don't you have control over? What do you have impact or influence over and what do you not have in, impact or influence over? What did you cause? Can you cure the problem? Can you control it? It's all of those kinds of things. And so recovery, in our work, working with parents, recovery for parents is about learning to be a different way, to, to learn how to be in the world in a different way and to learn how to be with people in a different way than any of us were taught or, or modeled. And, and, and for some, the way that we were taught or modeled worked for us well enough at least. We think so. It may have even worked for our other children well enough. At least it seems from the outcomes that it did for some of our other children, correct? But then there's this one child who's, who's signaling that something's not working for him or her. In other words, they're trying to escape your childhood with their acting out. So we learn to hear them differently. With, with a different kind of quality. We see their behaviors, but we don't simply respond to the behaviors at face value, the same way that you wouldn't cut a weed off in your yard at the surface, but you would go down into the roots where it starts, where it was born and understand it. And in all of this shift, that's really what it is. We ask you, for those of you that are new, I, I apologize because I'm, I'm using fairly complex concepts, and I'll get to some more basic concepts later on. For those of you who, who have been doing this for a while, this will be this will make sense to you. But the shift that we are asked to make by our with our children's struggle doesn't fix the child. It, it just doesn't. But what it does do is it fixes us. And that fix, right, that healing that recovery, that shift has powerful ripple effects in the world, starting with our family, our immediate family. When you start to 
you all know this. It's, I'm not telling you anything new, at least in other contexts. You know that if you're different with people, that it doesn't control them. It doesn't uh, um, overtake them. But you know you can be different with people in such a way to have an impact or an influence on them, to contribute to their well-being in a, in a more positive or, or less positive way, depending upon how you respond. So that's what we learn. And, and I think why it's so different, difficult in, in the parenting relationship is because there is no other relationship where we imagine that it is fundamentally our responsibility to control and shape and fix and carve out another human being. You know, some of us think that more or less to an extent in our partnerships, our marriage, right? We, we think it's our job to, to fix our spouse. Sometimes, some of us. Sometimes we think that about our siblings, our, our, our parents, our friends, maybe the people at work. But there's no other relationship than the parent to the child where we believe and buy into that the role is to shape them up, to create something. And so what psychology teaches us, what child psychology teaches us is, is that that way of thinking is harmful. It's actually self-interested in a lot of ways, meaning that we start to then measure our, 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 our success by how our child is doing, right? If they're doing well, it's almost as if we've been successful. It's our accomplishment. If they fail, it's our failure. That's more true with mothers in our culture and in most cultures, not all, than with fathers. Even in, in this day and age where we imagine ourselves to be uh, awakened, and we, we, we imagine ourselves in many cases to see men and women as, as equals. There still are, in our culture, an emphasis for women on how the children turn out and an emphasis for men on, on the, the professional income, right? The, 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 the providing for aspects of the family. There tends to be that emphasis. It can flip, of course, in, independent, in, in, in individual families and people, but that still is there, still is in the culture in the media. So this, th this is why I, I, I react so strongly to parenting models that give you a step-by-step -step manualized set of treatments, set of behaviors that imply, they don't always say it, but there is an implication that if you do it right, your child will turn out okay. And the reason your child has turned up, turned out the way he or she has, you've done it wrong. You have done it wrong. And this way of thinking pulls that apart. We, we start to understand our impact and our influence. And we ultimately surrender to one of the most frightening ideas that we can possibly consider. And that is we can't fix them or control them. It's a subtlety, right? But when you know it, when, when you're in it, you know it. And until you get it, it sounds like psychobabble. It sounds like semantics. It sounds like a, 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 you know, a magic trick, something else. And then because your child is struggling so much and you feel really that there's nowhere else to turn, you show up to a, a book a self-help book or a podcast like this or a webinar like this or a program like ours and, or an Al-Anon meeting or a Codependence Anonymous meeting and you start to hear something different that, you, that you've never heard before. You don't quite understand it, but you hear it. And somewhere deep inside of you, because it's different, you listen. And after a while, with lots of examples, it starts to make sense to you. It starts to become second nature to you. I remember I was sitting in a, in a group at, at one point, and I won't get into any details to protect any confidentiality, all confidentiality, but 
I was sitting in a group and every other group participant was giving feedback to somebody in our group along a certain line of thinking, trying to reassure this person of their, their, their goodness. And I'm listening to this and I'm getting more and more frustrated. It wasn't, again, there was no ill will. They were trying to encourage this person, trying to boost them up. And when it got to me, I just said, I, I have something different to offer. I don't think you're particularly wonderful. I think you're incredibly human. And I said, I think what I've learned is that we don't boost our self-esteem by convincing ourselves we're good fathers or husbands or mothers or wives or children. That's kind of short-lived. We, 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 true self-esteem is not realizing that you're good. Nobody's really ever thought that. True self-esteem is realizing that you're human, that you're good and bad, that you're a miracle and a, and a disaster at the same time, that you're wonderful and horrible, that you're strong and weak, and that it's okay. See, shame has two faces. Shame, the, the face of shame that most of us recognize is the person who beats themselves up, who shrinks, who feels horrible, who cowers and, and self-loathing. That face of shame we know. But the kind of shame that we don't recognize is the kind of shame that, that is constantly trying to prove how good it is and be good. Right? It, it's the narcissistic presentation where that person is always trying to compete and prove that they don't have any faults or flaws. And the worst, the worst thing that can happen to a narcissistically wounded person, which, by the way, is all of us, because the, the narcissistic wound is the wound of not being completely seen in childhood, which nobody was, not completely. The worst thing that can happen to a narcissistically wounded person in some way is for them to have ultimate success. Because if the narcissistically wounded person has ultimate, ultimate success, They don't have anything, any reason to, to look at themselves anymore. All the evidence in the world po points to how wonderful and great they are, and they don't have to look at themselves. And that is why our children, including me, our children struggling, requires us, asks us to, to ask certain questions of ourselves that other people whose children don't struggle don't have to ask. And while that might be painful and unpleasant, and we wouldn't wish this on our enemies, when we stick with it long enough, we eventually say the things that we would never think that we would say, which is, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. It changed my life. It, 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 it gave my life a richer, deeper meaning that it never had. It's not happiness. It's not just happiness. It's not that. But it's richer and, and it's deeper. So there's a new kind of way of thinking and being that we try to facilitate, foster, encourage, right? And it cannot be defined by steps. Now, I did the webinar, the broadcast, the podcast, and wrote the blog on the eight tools for transforming relationships. I mentioned that earlier. Um, because I know that some people learn from tools easier, but the tools don't fix the problem. But what they are is a practice Right? If you practice, for example, not using the word should in your life, just that, just that one tool. If you try to eradicate the words should and shouldn't in your life, over time, you would change how you think about yourself, about your decisions. Your anxiety and depression would reduce. You would feel differently about other people. So again, the, 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 the eradication, the, the replacing should, shouldn't with something else doesn't fix the problem. You're not immediately enlightened because you stop using those, those, those words, those phrases, which are virtually in a psychological sense, meaningless, if not toxic. But over time, the practice can start to lead to a shift, a fundamental shift in how you think about the world. So... 
started off with that question because it came up in clinical meeting. I'll get to some more basic questions as we go. And if you want some more complex questions, please ask them, uh, submit them at any time. How do you decide if your child should go, <laughs> should go on medication or just work through things in therapy? Again, there's no simple answer to that. I, I like to think of it this way. A couple of things. Number one, think about the side effects, right? What are the potential side effects of medication? Explore those. For some adults, for example, there are sexual side effects for some adults. And some people don't measure that as worth it against whatever the medication might do for them, for just an example. For some people, it gives them a sense of spaciness. Or for some people, will complain about not feeling enough. Something as simple as dry mouth or increase in, in, in weight or appetite are examples of side effects, right? You measure the side effects against the potential benefits. If your depression and anxiety is life-threatening, dry mouth probably isn't going to be a, a, a big measure against that, right? If your anxiety is, is absolutely relentless and causes you misery, having kind of a, a, a numbed sexual drive, a limited sexual drive is going to be okay. You can live with that, right? So you start to measure them against each other. If it's just stigma, that's probably something to work through because that's contrived. That's just culturally, that's just a cultural construct that doesn't have any basis in reality. We all come with various predispositions chemically to all kinds of things, diabetes, right? Cancer. Depression. We don't think of, of medication for uh, cancer as a stigma, right? People getting chemotherapy aren't weaker because they take chemotherapy for when they have cancer compared to those who just decide not to take it. So if it's about stigma and ego, that's probably something to work through. Another th thing that I think about is if, if you can't use therapy enough, if it's not making a difference, I always think about medication this way. Some people can't even get into to the starting block. They can't even get into the starting block for the race, right? If therapy or, or life is, is the race, they can't even get started. They can't even get to the, 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 the track, get out of bed, right? They can't calm their mind enough to make sense out of the therapy that they might be attending. So then you start to measure, do you need something chemically? Now understand this, trauma affects the brain chemically. Attachment affects the brain chemically. We're all predisposed, but if you had an especially nurturing and calm childhood, guess what you're going to have more of in your brain? Things like serotonin, right? If you have a very stressful environment, guess what you're going to have less of in your brain? Serotonin. And then we call it a chemical imbalance, but some of it that's contextually created, right? Drug addicts who, who augment uh, themselves, who self-medicate using drugs, they, they reduce the brain's ability to make, to produce the, the nervous system's ability to produce dopamine. And so without drugs and alcohol, they feel depressed, empty, dull. So what we call a chemical imbalance is in part a genetic predisposition and in part as a result from the environment. So therapy can change, can change brain chemistry over time, just like trauma and, and poor attachment can change brain chemistry over time. So the answer is there's no right, generic, perfect solution. It's a thought process that you go through side effects, pros and cons. Can you make something out of it? Are you just, Re reacting to the stigma, those are the kinds of things that go into the question. I, I will tell you this, if any of you come into contact with professionals who are, who have one opinion on either side of this equation that is absolute, it's ridiculous. Meaning that if you meet a professional who thinks nobody should take medication, that's ridiculous. If you meet a person that says, Everybody should be on medication. That should be the first thing out of the gate. That's obviously ridiculous. 
And so like with most things in therapy, a therapist is there to help you find your truth. What's true for you, right? The wisdom that's hidden inside of you. So that's, that's in part how you know how you have a professional that you're working with that can be helpful. Next question, in relationships, how do you know if you are compromising yourself too much? This also came out of our clinical meeting, actually. It was worded a, a little bit differently than this, but um, I was talking about the idea of, of kind of um, containing, which is a, a therapeutic term that means just holding compassionate, empathic space for somebody, remaining curious and patient with somebody. That's, that's what containing means. So I was describing this in the therapeutic sense and, and with clients versus, you know, holding a boundary, maybe even in, in relationships. There, there, there can be a point in relationships when it's too much. is It's just too much. I, I can't do this anymore, right? And somebody asked, they, they, one of the clinicians asked the question. They said, how do you know? How do you know if you should be making more of a sacrifice and compromising or if you should get out? And my answer to the question is, that's the right question. That's the right question. You get to decide. You get to figure out when enough is enough. And I will tell you this. At some risk. Um, I will tell you that um, the more work you do, which which really in a sense means or is part of the more self-care you do, the more you take care of yourself, the greater your capacity to hold space for other people. And also, the more clear and certain you become when it's too much, right? I am a better father today than I was 26 years ago when my first child was born. I'm a better father. I'm more capable. I'm more patient. I'm more open and flexible. I'm also, I have less self-doubt. So when it's a boundary, I'm less afraid or insecure to set it. I had a pseudo confidence when I was younger and a kind of an arrogance a defensive kind of confidence when I was younger. Now I, 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 I don't know if I'm right more and more. I'm comfortable not knowing, but I'm, I'm more comfortable being me and not very interested in defending it. I was very interested in defending myself when I was younger. So you get to decide. You get to decide if your alcoholic spouse is too much, if your child's abuse is too much. You get to decide where the boundary is. And, and hopefully you have a, a mentor, a sponsor, a friend, at least in my world, ideally a therapist that can help you figure that out. Then figure out what's at play inside of your head. What are the old messages? What are the old beliefs that you need to tear down to be free? As Freud called them, what are the unconscious obligations that you need to kill? And then you get to be a person, a self, and it's wonderful. And then you spend your, the rest of your life answering that question. What do I want? What can I give? And it's not a selfish, self-centered kind of question. It is a compassionate, loving, generous, authentic kind of, kind of path. Next question. In relationships, how do you know? Oh, just read that one. How do you know when you're just trying to consider something to do if it is your ego that is motivating you? That's a harder one. Um, a lot of these questions were asked to me, again, in clinical meeting and in other settings because I didn't have any pre-submitted questions, although it looks like I, I've had a few that have come in this evening already. I'll give you an answer that my therapist gave me not, not too long ago when I was considering a project for myself. Asking my therapist or, 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 or talking through with my therapist the question of whether or not my ego was motivating or not, she finally said to me, screw it. You've been talking about this for years. Just do it. You'll figure it out. 
right? I was too careful. And she kind of gave me permission to, to just do it. For me, that was helpful. But but how you know your, is your ego is involved is really around, is the thing an attempt to prove that you're a good something or other? Or that you're worthwhile? You're worthy. You're valuable. If the thing that you're considering is for that, then it's for ego. There's no sin in that, right? It just means that, that it's a wound that's being covered up. Right? If one of you won the Academy Award, right? That would temporarily, for most people, they would imagine, it would temporarily uh, cover up, fill in the hole of a wounded ego, right? We can all imagine that. Standing up on stage in front of other actors on, 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 on the screen for millions of people watching, people applauding you and telling you, you did the best job at what you do for a living of anybody that year. Winning this, the Super Bowl, right? Wimbledon, salesperson of the year, senator for your state, on and on and on. Those things can be um, temporarily, it's, it's kind of like junk food or candy. It feels good, but there's an emptiness that comes afterwards to it. And for me, Honestly, it just takes decades. Gosh, if I could, if a wish could come true for me as a result of, of evoke therapy programs, it's a given that we would provide children with wonderful treatment that would help them to heal, to know that they were okay, truly okay. And that the ways that they were self-medicating or acting out were just the, 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 the young wounded child trying to get their needs met in a way that, that, also brings harm to them. I would love for, for children to have that experience and that would be wonderful for me. But because in many ways I'm more connected to the parents because that's where my focus is, it would be for all of you to, to know, to, to find a therapeutic practice for the rest of your lives. Not because you should or it's the right thing to do. Not for your children, although that's, not a horrible reason to start. But because you came to taste the sweetness of what it feels like to sit with somebody for an hour a week who unconditionally loves you, sees you, seeks to understand you. And the shift that occurs in a, occurs in a human psyche with that experience is it's indescribable. It changes everything and every relationship in your life. And, and, I, and I wish that I could give parents the, 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 the wherewithal, the, the confidence to just get rid of the stigma, the shame of, of therapy, right? That, that the, the only people that are at risk are the ones that aren't in therapy. At risk of... of of not being their, their most authentic, genuine, loving, compassionate, enlightened, everything, right? That's what I wish. I wish people listening to this would just have a glimpse of what we're talking about enough. And by the way, after that glimpse and after tasting a little bit, all you want to do is give it away. Right? It's like having the salt vaccine, the, the, the vaccine for polio. You want to give it away to the entire world for free. <clears throat> That's all you want. Because you know how it heals. And you know you, you've torn down the, the lies that have been presented to you by previous generations. At no fault of theirs. It just was fueled by fear and it was the only thing that they knew. That's what I wish. Next question. I've done a lot of work, but I still feel anxious. How do I know when I'm doing the right thing or not? There was a turning point in therapy for me when um, I realized that the fear wasn't going to go away. 
I just realized that I was going to have a great therapy session where I was going to feel okay and safe and, and know that what I felt and thought was just, it was okay. It wasn't good or great. It was just okay. I'm okay. And then I was going to get into my car and leave the session and go back out into the world and absolutely lose that sense that I'm okay. And I remember the day when it struck me because probably because of the, the, the powerful and profound juxtaposition between my therapy session, the anxiety that I had coming into the session, how much it dissipated during the session and how quickly it returned to me after the session. I was thinking about something that I wanted to say to my wife. I didn't even want to bring it up in therapy because I didn't want to even consider that I needed to tell her this thing. I didn't, don't even know what it was. It was shortly after our reconciliation after we were separated for about a year and a half, I told my therapist and she said, like she always does, that makes sense. It's okay. You're not crazy. You're not bad. Sharing that feeling of that thought with your wife is perfectly fine. And I thought after listening to this for an hour, she's right. I'm okay. I'm not crazy or mean or selfish or stupid or too sensitive or whatever it is. Whatever the, the internal dialogue that, that I carry around with me that I, that I got from my childhood, whenever I show up, it tells me that what I think and feel is not okay. So I, I, I end the session with absolute peace and confidence. Get in my car, get on the freeway. It's a 20 minute drive home. By the time I get on the, on the off ramp, that leads to my house, seven minutes away from my house, as I'm pulling to the stop and I, I know exactly where it is. This is like 10 years ago. As I'm coming to that stop, I think to myself, there's no way in the world I'm going to tell my wife this. No chance. I'm terrified of how she'll react. And then I thought, you know what? You've done this before. You're just going to have to tell her scared. You're going to have to tell her scared. You can, you can talk over the programming that you got from your childhood. You can combat it. So you're going to go home and you're going to say the words that you know to say, and you're going to be terrified and you're going to be sure that it's going to go horribly. By the way, still can't remember what it was. Went home, told my wife whatever it was, and she acted like it was nothing. And thanked me for telling her. Now, I, I want to give some credit to my wife because my wife has done a tremendous amount of work. She's a therapist. She has been as committed or more than I have to her therapeutic practice as a client for the past 23 years. So she has some great capacity, which sometimes I, I, I either underestimate or sometimes I just project onto her my previous context, principally my childhood, and assume she's going to react that way. And there's been times, of course, when she's reacted really horribly in our past or our present. So all of that comes into play. But in this case, I went home. I told her I was scared. I told her the truth. She thanked me. She applauded me. She welcomed it. It wasn't easy, whatever it was. And we were okay. So back to that question. We get enough therapy so that we're willing to do it scared. Right? We're willing to do it unsure. We know that what we're about to say is the, is the right thing for us to say or to do. We know we can't control it. We surrender to the, to the human reality that we can't control or engineer the outcome that we want. We embrace that. And, and while we're in embracing that, we do the thing. And sometimes it goes absolutely to pot. Sometimes it has the worst outcome. Many times it has a wonderful outcome. Unanticipated people like my wife rise to the, uh, the occasion, surprise us and impress us. But we've found ourself. And I was talking to a friend today about this idea about marriage and divorce and how about how marriage isn't staying married is not the solution and getting divorced is not the solution. Sending your child to evoke is not the solution and not sending your child to evoke is not the solution. The solution is finding yourself. 
then the choice comes out of that. So when I was talking to my friend about marriage and divorce, the conversation was, that's not the question. The question, going back to what that therapist asked in our clinical meeting this week, is what are you okay with and what do you not? What do you need? Can you get enough? You know, if you've seen the movie Good Will Hunting, which is one of my favorite movies, probably because it's such a therapy-rich movie, there's a scene where Robin Williams asks Matt Damon, what do you want? And he can't answer the question. Matt Damon in, the, in this in this movie, if you haven't seen it, is a, a genius, right? An, an unqualified genius, intellectually, math mathematics, history, philosophy, literature, everything. He's a genius. And what Robin Williams figures out is, you don't know yourself, you don't know what you want, and you're just afraid. If you haven't seen the movie. See it if you haven't seen it in a long time. Watch it again. Um, this process is about the discovery of self. So that's how you know. Because you find yourself, you act from that place, you do it afraid, scared, insecure, unsure, surrendering to the reality of life that is that you can't control things, and then you still have yourself after that. All right, let me get to the questions that have come in. One says, my child is at the Cascade Mountains in your program. People have asked me to explain the reason for the wilderness experience. Can you explain that in greater detail? Absolutely. We run an experiential program because of a couple of reasons. It becomes a microcosm for life. Wilderness therapy is like the universe, only smaller. Right? Every relationship, every dynamic, gets exposed experientially. A lot of people, especially people that are defended, and most of the clients that we have are really well defended, are good at eluding therapists or faking it or saying the right things or memorizing things like the 12 steps or slogans or things like that. Experiential therapy exposes you. You can't fake it. You can't hold your breath. I My clientele in my group for the 15 years that I was a primary therapist in wilderness therapy were mostly good at faking good. I, it wasn't all of them. I would say about 20 to 25%. They couldn't even fake it. They couldn't even look good. They would tell me once in a while, those guys would tell me once in a while, I worked with adolescent boys mostly. They would say, well, oh, I could fake it. <clears throat> and I would say to those guys, show me <clears throat> just for a day. Or, or three days, fake good. Of course, they couldn't. They were so impulsive and so um, dysregulated. They, they couldn't do it, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can't hold your breath. You, you have peers. You have interactions. A lot of kids would come to sessions and they would start to do the assignments. I'd say, hey, slow down a second. Let's talk about what happened this week. There was this divorce or separation in early wilderness therapy programs between the session and the week. By the way, how many of you can relate to that? Your child performs okay. He, he or she can look decent in their weekly therapy session. At least that's the report that you get. But then you come home and it's a nightmare. So wilderness therapy, it's all the stuff that happens in between the sessions. Of course, the therapy is important. It anchors the week. Of course, we try to blend and integrate the two. That's why the staff attend the sessions. But it's like life. And you get exposed. And your defenses are stripped. And that's the that's that one of the reasons is because of that, that exposure. But the second is because most trauma is not conscious or verbal. Right? Most trauma is unconscious and nonverbal. And so if you talk to somebody, they don't have access to whatever it is that's at the root of whatever the symptom is that you're seeing. They just don't have access to it. It's not denial, as you would think about denial. It's unawareness. It's an unconscious repression, right? It's partly denial, but not the way that most people think of denial. It's buried. 
So we do it because it exposes the dynamic and we can treat it in real time. And we do it because we believe that the value of talk therapy only goes so far, that it is experience and exposure and kinesthetic and, and, and interactions and relationships where we get access to the issues that are really at play. Next question. Can you share uh, what the clients in your programs eat while they're in wilderness? Can you also share how they bathe? It's not easy out there. Uh, I, I used to tease before I sent my son, my oldest, to wilderness that if I could choose, I would send my child in the winter. Now, it came up that, that the time that he got sent was in October, November, December, January, February, right? The last day of October. So it worked out that way. It's a better program because everything is intentional. Everything is difficult. Bathing, we, we heat up water uh, over a fire. We, we create a, a little shelter where, where the kids can bathe with the warmed up water. We call them billy baths, billy cans. They're like big giant coffee cans um, that, that are burnt out and cleaned. Um, so they bathe that way. Sometimes they, they'll pour it into a, a something called a sun shower where they can pour the warm water in this 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 bag, this big thick rubber bag that has like a what looks like a shower head on it and stand underneath that. They have wet wipes and they have hand sanitizer um, wipes for themselves. The, the girls have extra for some of their hygiene. So it's difficult, uncomfortable, unpleasant, challenging. I remember one day when a student came up to us, I was meeting with the staff, going over some treatment plans for the week. And one of the boys said, do I have to take a bath? I'm going to get dirty in 15 minutes because it's windy and the dirt is blowing up. And the staff started to react. And I said, yeah, you do. I mean, I'm not going to wrestle you for it, but it's an expectation. And the staff was about to try to talk him into the, the virtue of it. And when the, when the student walked away, I said to the staff, I said, it's just hard. It's hard to live outdoors. We take so much for granted indoors. And so everything takes intention and effort. And we can't take it for granted. So it's difficult. What they eat, we have fresh fruits and vegetables every day. We have meat at least a couple of dinners per week. For breakfast, they have oats and granola. Um, for, for lunch, they have meats, various kinds of meats, cheeses, peanut butter, tortillas, kind of sandwiches and wraps, uh, rice and beans for a lot of the dinners, pasta at night. There's a lot of carbs in the diet because they're, they're, that helps them stay warm in the winter and helps them hike and, and, and have energy from when they're hiking during the day. Um, they have spices. They can have desserts if, if, as, as, as a reward, um, hot chocolate things like that. Um, we try to keep processed sugar at a minimum, processed food at a very minimum. We try to be as organic as possible and to source our food locally as much as possible. We, we try to see the, the connection between the mind, body, and spirit. So we try to have lean, few preservatives, little processed sugar, and fruits and vegetables as much as possible. It's, I love the food out there. I, I crave the food out there. Um, and it gets old when you're doing it for a couple of months. I understand the concept one parent says of parents setting boundaries, but what is an appropriate response when our child's response is defiant setting of his own boundaries and that directly contradicts our boundaries? I mean, that's the question, right? You, 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 you have to make it, I, you set boundaries wherever you want and you escalate them, right? Sometimes it's this. If your child is an adult, the ultimate kind of the, the, the nuclear option is they don't get to live at home or you cut them off, right? It can get that extreme. If you can afford a vote, you do something like that. If you can't, you know, you can only do what you can do. And, and you set boundaries. There's a shift about boundary thinking when we talk about this. Boundary thinking is more for self-care than it is. It's not about control. I have a couple of podcasts on boundaries, webinars on boundaries. 
Um, there's a chapter in my first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, on control versus influence. So you want to stay out of power struggles, obviously. You know, I found some success with my oldest son when I, I backed off some of the boundaries and I opened up some space. He got sober right after I backed up, backed off some of the boundaries. I'm not saying that would work, but I tried it because it was a shift. I tried it because it was different. There's times when I come down hard on the kids with boundaries and there's times when I back off. But but it's, 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 it's a learning, like, like I said in that first quote tonight, it's a learning to think about it differently. My therapist asked me one time when my son was struggling, my oldest, he said, what's your ultimate goal? And I said, first and foremost, I want my son to, to have a meaningful and rich life. And she said, great, that's a great objective to always be thinking about. And then she said, what's your goal in relationship to your son? And I said, I want to be a resource to him, a help and a support to him. And she said, that's another good thing to think about when you're making decisions. So I, I started to think about those two things and I made different decisions. I made some radically counterintuitive decisions. So it's not a, it's not a simple answer not a simple question to answer about the question about what about boundaries when they're defiant, but think about everything. Work with somebody where you start to realize what's your, what's your participation in the power struggle. And ultimately, you might not be able to do anything that has an impact on your child whatsoever. That is a reality, right? We all know that. Ultimately, none of us control our children. And believe me, I have tried with the best of them to control my children. It is a constant practice of mine to let go of control with my children. Like I said, at the same time, still maintaining authentic, clear boundaries. But ultimately, we cannot control another person. So it's the right question. Someone asked, I'll answer this question. All of these webinars are available as a podcast afterwards. All of them are. They all go into the podcast app the following day. Last question I have for this evening is how do we deal with the weather, weather elements? Um, we deal with them very conservatively, meaning that uh, we make sure the kids are safe and we struggle. Some of the staff sometimes say, years of training, I've been asked the question by our staff, what do we do in the winter months when there are short days, and the weather is extreme. How do we do therapy then? I've been asked for decades. And my response is, that's the therapy. That's the therapy. That's the grist for the mill. It's not that much different. I had a discussion with my 17-year-old tonight about doing the dishes, doing their chores, doing their homework. Right? We don't think of those things as therapy, but, but keeping their feet dry and warm. Make sure, make, make sure that they're maintaining their gear. Make sure that they're not putting their shoes too close to the fire so that they will shrink if they dry out too quickly. Make sure they're cooperating with the staff and the safety protocols so that they're warm and dry, that they're organized. All those things that go into to, to primitive living become grists for the mill. Because we are an outdoor experiential program. Let me tell you, I, I have been in as a child and seeing programs where there's a TV, they play card games at night, on the weekends they watch movies and play video games. They go into a cafeteria and they don't have to, they get served food and then they turn in the, 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 the dishes to the kitchen afterwards. I've seen those places. And while some, some good therapy can happen in those places and does, I would choose wilderness therapy and the difficulty and the challenge of the heat in the summer, the bugs in the spring, the snow and the cold in the winter, the lightning storms and the thunderstorms in the fall, I would choose that backdrop, that delivery method for therapy with adolescents and young adults over residential any day of the week in terms of its dynamic, powerful impact on, on uncovering a person's true nature and ability to cope. All right, let's go with upcoming announcements and then I'm going to wrap up for this evening. So all parents are invited to the parent workshop. We want all parents that possibly can to come to one parent workshop. 
The next one is January 25th and 26th at our Utah program. Ask your therapist at Entrada if this can be combined with a, uh, a visit to see your child if the timing is right. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon. In the coming couple of weeks, I'll be announcing my new book, The Audacity to Be You, Learning to Love Your Horrible Rotten Self, is the final title. Um, if you want to do a deeper dive into your own work, in fact, one is going on right now. It's happening as we speak. The next available one for a therapeutic intensive, a four and a half day intensive, which is worth six months of therapy. And the best thing I think you can do for your child, finding you, evokes finding you in, in, in Utah, February 19th through 23rd is the next one that's available. I do one every year. I've done 10 myself, everybody in my family. We send our therapists to do one. We love them. I'm also going to be doing one outside of London, England, May 8th through 10th. If you've been to Finding You, we have two Finding You 2s coming up, April 16th and July 15th. Um, so email intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information or go to our website. Uh, all of these broadcasts are available on social media. So on your iPhone, use the podcast app on an Android device, use the SoundCloud app or go to your computer and go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy programs using the handle at Evoke Therapy, or in you can find our intensive program on Instagram using the hashtag, excuse me, the, the handle at Evoke Summit Lodge. On Facebook, you can find us by searching at Evoke Therapy, or excuse me, Evoke Therapy programs. The Alumni Foundation on Facebook by searching Evoke Family Foundation, or you can look at our blog for upcoming content. Uh, we have pursuits trips that are custom all over the world for families or young adults. Think sober fun or therapy light or kind of reconnecting to your therapeutic roots and ideas. Our parent support group coming up. I'll be in New York City on January 27th. So if you're anywhere in that area, you are welcome to come January 27th, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Email melanie at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Um, if you have friends and family that are in that area who want to come for some parent support and education that night, that's fantastic. It's 7 p.m. at the City University of New York Graduate School, which is on 5th Avenue and 35th Street, I believe. Um, I'll have more announcements for more parent meetings coming up after that. Somebody asked, can there be, can a Finding You 2 be a Finding You 3? Absolutely. Yeah. You could come to a Finding You some of you have been to Finding You Too, so you can come to Finding You Too if you've been to two already. Uh, that's a great idea, actually. I don't have the title for my next broadcast, but I'll, I'll, I'll get that out to you in the next day or so. Um, but it will be next Tuesday, January 14th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for and on behalf of your child. If you're new, I apologize for some of the more heady content early on in the session. But we have a vast library of podcasts and webinars for you to access archives. So just scroll through those and look at any of those topics and see what, what fits or feels right for you. Thank you again for joining us for and on behalf of your loved ones for the work that you're willing to do and the heroic um, gesture it is to look at yourself. Have a great week, rest of the weekend and, and weekend and I'll talk to you next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Take care, bye-bye.